Just before I came out here, friends, on this program, the program director up in the booth shouted down that the third candle on the right was crooked. So we asked the angel to come and straighten it, which the angel did because the angel hates anything that is crooked. But as he was straightening the candle, there came back to my mind the memory of, a, of an old Monsignor in St. Louis. He came out one morning for mass and found four candles lighted. He should have had only two for a low mass, and he called the altar boy and he said, uh, who told you to light four candles? The altar boy says, M Mrs. McEntee. Where is Mrs. McEntee? She's down in the front pew. The old Monsignor said, will you go down and give Mrs. McEntee three swift kicks, one for Moses, one for me, and one for Elias? You have the title, Happiness is a Rainbow, but this does not come in at the beginning of this show. Only about the middle of it will we find out why happiness is a rainbow. But I must tell you at the beginning why we chose this particular subject. It's because there's so much gloom in the world. I do not mean light, uh, frivolous gloom, like uh, a poor widow who was visited by the insurance company after the death of her husband, and uh, he gave her a check for $50,000. And the insurance agent said, I'm sure you're very sad after having lost your husband. And she said, well, I would give $5,000 to have him back. <laughs> I'm not referring to that kind of gloom nor even the gloom of a, of a mother who already had three children, and she was about to have her fourth. And she said to the doctor, she's, oh, she said, how I dread this. The doctor said, well, you had no trouble with the other three? Oh, she says, that isn't the problem. It's the future PTA meetings that I dread. <laughs> now, the gloom I'm talking about is much more serious. I've heard many people remark that, uh, Notice now when you see people on the street how sad they look. And there's the gloom of the theater, the gloom of the songs of the young. For example, at 15, boys and girls singing, I lost the love life of my life. But the more serious things, like, for example, uh, the novel of Francois Sagan, Bonjour, Tristesse, imagine that. Hello, Sadness. How are you, gloom? Then the other great dramatist, Camus, who wrote the plague. Remember, it was the story of a dedicated doctor in northern Africa, Dr. Rieu. And during this pestilence, he spent himself and was spent in his laboratory in caring for patients to stop the pestilence. It was abated, but he knew that it was in the furniture, it was in the clothing, it was in houses, and would break out again. So the gloom of the play was, that's all life is. It's meaningless. And all of our evils are going to constantly reoccur. That's our modern gloom. Another novelist, Cossack. The city beyond the river. Now, he, he gives this in a kind of a parable, namely, here on one side of the river is a factory. This factory takes great big rocks and grinds and grinds them up into tiny little stones. Then it, when it gets tiny little stones, it bakes all the little stones together and gets a great big rock. Then they send the rock over to a factory on the other side of the river, which grinds the rock up into little stones, then bakes them together in a great big rock and ships them back to the first factory. 
with the gloom of uh, adultery, homosexuality, murder and violence that one sees in the theater, one really wonders if we're not like pigs who thinks that the farmer that's seated at a table does not know reality. Is not the gloom today very much like deaf men inviting an orchestra? No wonder the great psychiatrist Carl Menninger said that. He said it is not so much that there is, are no joys today, it's the fact that there is no hope on account of our gloom. Now, how did we get that way? How? Well, I'm going to try to give you an illustration of how. And we will diagram it. This is the way we live. We live on a horizontal plane of the flat surface of space and time. We're working out, we work out our economic livelihood, contribute to social betterment and so forth on this level. But we know that it's quite inadequate. So, to cover up this inadequacy, we know that because the loves here do not completely satisfy, that we have to go out to a love beyond. So life is completed by a vertical line. Namely, there must be a beauty, as Thompson put it, that leaves all other beauty pain. A love we fall just short of in our love. So this is man, and he's almost at the center of it. And it's, this is normal, and we will show later on that these two are both involved in human existence. But we're trying to explain gloom. Here we started with normal human life. The gloom came in by eliminating this. Our life is limited solely to the plane of the secular. Now, when man has only this flat surface here, he gets sick and tired of it. So what does he do? He, this is man here. You know I can't draw, but that's, I always put, I always tell you what I'm drawing, that's man. So that man, man tires of this flat surface of life. So he begins pulling it up around himself. And lo and behold, he gets locked in. And he gets locked in in two ways. He gets locked in socially in a closed society, which is Marxism and communism. And he gets locked in psychologically. So that his life is nothing but made up of an analysis of his fears and anxieties and dreads. That's the reason modern man is is sad and, and tragic. He's thrown off the vertical. But I'm not here to explain to you the, the gloomy side. I want to tell you now how to get out of this gloom and how we can recover happiness. And the key to it is the rainbow. How is the rainbow made? The rainbow is made by light shining through rain. The rainbow is the child of storm. It comes out of the womb of darkness. Every drop of rain, we'll get back to gloom in a minute. See, the rain is the gloom. Every drop of rain is a prism. And when a ray of light strikes the raindrop, which is the prism, breaks up into the seven rows, rays of the spectrum. And if you could take all of those rays back again, you'd get a pure ray of light. Now, the rain strikes other things. It strikes the rose, strikes the lily. And uh, 
It does not, however, like the raindrop, throw back every ray. It absorbs some, keeps them for itself. That's the difference in colors between red and blue flowers and the like. But notice that both of them are selfless. The, the rose does not take all of the rays of light, just some. Gives back others. The raindrop doesn't take any. So the raindrop is what? The raindrop is a combination of sorrow and laughter, of tears and a smile. There's a bit of sadness. Too much sadness makes gloom. There's darkness, but there's also light. The rainbow therefore tells us that life itself is made up of both a little bit of sadness and a little bit of joy. The two are mixed, like that vertical and horizontal line. And these are specifically human, namely the tear and the smile. You never find a smile in the animal kingdom. Never. I know. Hyenas have their mouths open, but they don't laugh. A horse really doesn't give a horse laugh. You find laughter only when you come to man. And you find tears only when you come to man. And you find them both mingled in man. Why do you find a, a smile and laughter only in man? Well, what is laughter? Now, I'm going to give you a definition. It's not a bit funny but it, it really is the explanation of laughter. Laughter is the unexpected juxtaposition of two ideas. Juxtaposition of two ideas. Let me think of a pun. A little uh, girl was visited by the neighbor, and the neighbor said to the little girl, what are you going to do when you get as big as your mother? The little girl said, diet. Well, thanks for laughing. Otherwise, I couldn't prove the point. <laughs> I'm glad you laughed. Now, why did you laugh? You see, you had to have two ideas simultaneously. You had to have, first of all, the idea of big as physical size. And secondly, you had to have the idea of big as age. Now, if a box is filled with pepper, it can't be filled with salt. If we were material creatures and we were filled with one idea, we couldn't be filled with the other at the same time. So that laughter is an indication of the fact that we are at the borderland of matter and spirit, both. I might add, too, that the ideas that are juxtaposed, they have to be unexpected. If you knew this, you wouldn't have laughed, except for politeness, for which I thank you. <laughs> now, tears, the tears exactly the same way. You don't begin to cry and then get a telegram about the death of a friend. First of all, you have the idea. Then after you get the idea of uh, sorrow, then comes the tears. So that gloom is an exaggeration. But there's a place, however, for something that is sad. Happiness is a rainbow. It's not just all laughter. It's not just all tears. The problem is, which comes first? Now think this out for yourself. Which do you think comes first? Are we first of all to laugh and then to cry? Are we first of all to weep and then to laugh? Here, as we answer these questions, we hit upon two distinct philosophies of life. One philosophy of life, which is the Christian, is this. First the fast, then the feast. The other philosophy of life is first the feast, and then the hangover. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
<laughs> the, the Christian philosophy of life is, therefore, first, you have to have the rain before you can have a rainbow. It's the light shining through the rainbow, shining through the, the drop that makes the rainbow. And this is what our blessed Lord said, woe to you that laugh, for you shall weep. Imagine. He didn't mean that we shouldn't laugh because he himself teased the apostles asking where they were to find bread when he knew very well where they were to have it. And it wasn't because he went around glum, because he said, when you fast, he said, he said, anoint your face, put oil on your hair, so that you'll appear to men not to fast. It was therefore not on account of gloom, it was rather the fact that reserve the great happiness for the end. There's a little bit of self-discipline at the very beginning. That's the Christian philosophy of life. A little discipline, a little correction of self, and then at the end, joy. Now the other philosophy of life is uh, first, you start with laughter, with pleasure, with joy, and then where do you end? Did you ever read the story of uh, Oscar Wilde? The portrait of Dorian Gray? You know, I, uh, I forgot to give a signal to my angel before about uh, cleaning my backboard, but he this time I gave the signal quite unwittingly, and lo and behold, the angel did it. If you turn over to the blackboard now, you'll see it. See, it's all very clean, see? Isn't this wonderful age we live in? <laughs> well, Oscar Wilde was the type of man who started with a feast. He determined that his life was going to be led aesthetically and not ethically. In other words, there will be no concern for what is right, what is just, what is good, or what is evil. It is only whether or not it gives pleasure. So this story, the portrait of Dorian Gray, is a kind of an autobiography. This handsome youth has his portrait painted. And in that painting, he stands in all of his promise handsomeness, virility, gaiety, and gladness. A portrait normally has timelessness about it. Our portrait is painted at a certain age, and that's the age the portrait remains. But in the story of Oscar Wilde, it's the portrait that grows old, and it's Dorian Gray, the young man who remains young. So that as he lives his life of pleasure, starting with the feast, he never changes. He's always the aesthetically beautiful and lovely. But that portrait, week by week, month by month, year by year, it ages, wrinkles becomes senile. All of the remonstrances of conscience, all of the inspirations of the spirit that he spurned, all of the evil that he did, and all of its excesses seem to be drawn each day as if some invisible brush were painting over that portrait. This was the real Dorian Gray. At the end, he had nothing. He saw what he was, and he couldn't stand it any longer. And he takes a knife to plunge it into that portrait. Servants come in sometime later. They see hanging on the wall the portrait of a handsome, young, promising youth. And at the bottom of the portrait, 
Dorian Gray, with a knife in his heart. He had started with a light instead of the raindrop. So in answer to the gloomy dramatists and novelists who call the garbage pale and the excesses of life reality, may we say that they have a point, but they've exaggerated it. There's both in life, and that's what makes it wonderful and great. Just as in weaving, there's a warp and a woof. There is a line of sadness, and there's also a line of gladness. There's the horizontal stitch, and there's the vertical stitch. And the makers of these great tapestries, like the Goblin tapestry, Never work from the front, as maybe you do your needlework. They have before them just the image, the portrait, of what they want to portray. But they work from the back of the tapestry, not from the front. And they weave one thread after another, the two. The light, the raindrops. And finally, when it's all finished, then they look at what they've done. They started behind where they could not quite understand the mystery. But they finished by understand the fullness of light. Tab put it well, describing that manner in which these tapestries are made. My life is but a weaving between my God and me. I may but choose the colors he worketh skillfully. For loft he chooses sorrow. And I, in foolish pride, forget he sees the upper. And I, the underside. So the true philosophy of life then becomes Good Friday and Easter Sunday. Unless there's the Good Friday in life, there will never be the Easter Sunday. Unless there is the cross, there will never be the empty tomb. And when I look at the sky, I see exactly the same lesson taught. Happiness is a rainbow. Well, I hope this has not been a sad story for you. I hope it's been nothing but gladness and joy because it paints that way. I'm a little sad because I have to leave you. But with joy, I say, bye now. God love you. Fulton J. Sheen is indeed a man for all seasons. He walked a paced beat, allowing us to glimpse his nature and ponder its worth and to enjoy its presence. Bishop Sheen authored over 90 books. He broadcast countless radio and television programs and ministered in many parts of the world to people of every belief. As he said many times, it is not a unity of religion we plead for, but a unity of religious people. We may not be able to meet in the same pew, but we can meet on our knees. The bishop wrote 94 books, recorded countless radio shows, and appeared on hundreds of network and syndicated television programs. His legacy is a treasure of joy that transcends time and helps us to believe that truly, life is worth living.